There's good and bad in all of us. It doesn't matter how far you run. There are some demons you just can't escape. And I, li I like the, the, when you play these dueling characters in movies. Like you look at adaptation. It's almost even like Face Off, like where you're playing like two extreme characters. Like yeah. Looking back at your other films, if you could have had another dueling character to bounce off one of your other characters, what what character do you think would have benefited from that? I, I think that if you look at Leaving Las Vegas, there would be some something interesting about seeing Ben Sanderson before he started drinking, hanging out with Ben Sanderson drinking. And that, that would have been an interesting relationship. The sequel, the prequel. Something, yeah, yeah. just to see what went wrong. This time around you play John, John and you also play Ghost Rider. Right. And the last time you didn't do that. Correct. Well, talk about what it looked like when you were actually shooting these sequences. Like where, where, what was the makeup looking like? I mean, you had like, your eyes were blacked out. Well, I, I said to Brian Taylor off the bat, and when he asked me in New Orleans, would you do the Ghost Rider as well? And I said, yes, but can I wear a mask? So, because I felt that I could, if I wore the, or painted my face in some way to look like a skull or like a voodoo icon, and you know, blacked out my eyes with contact lenses, that it would, it would instill a kind of aura around me that would put fear in my co-stars or in my directors or in the crew that I would see, and then that would, you know, like oxygen to a forest fire would make me believe I was the character. So that helped me stay honest with it, so I didn't feel ridiculous or absurd. Uh, and, and then I, I would try to present a kind of movement that would be like a bad dream. I wanted it to be not fully something you could understand. I wanted you to be aware that you were in the presence of some entity from another dimension. So I had to kind of rethink how I would move and what kind of aura I would have uh, around me as the Ghost Rider. I need your help. This child is in danger. Daddy! I don't say fear. If you don't help, the devil will have a new form, one more powerful than he's ever known. And a shadow will fall upon the earth. Save the boy and lift your curse. Uh, your character is dealing with these inner demons, and, right. he, and he wants to shake this inner demon, and it keeps coming back to him and back to him. Yeah. And I want to ask you, looking back over your career, is there a character that you played that has stuck with you, like this inner demon, that you wish that you could shake? Um, uh, that I wish I could shake? No, because um, when I make a movie, I maybe watch it once and then I put it behind me. I, I don't live with it. I don't carry it with me. I'm very much about what's the next step. So I'm not trying to shake anything off of me in terms of my work. Right. And so but the characters that don't emotionally ever stay with you, they don't come back to you. No. No. Um, now, uh, Spirit of Vengeance, because it's, it's another incarnation of John Blaze and Ghost Rider, that gave me a chance to think about where I wanted to go with the character. Right. And it's clear that he has a different state of mind because he's been living with the curse for over eight years, and it's made him kind of sar sarcastic, ironic, cynical. Yeah. His sense of humor is not unlike a, a cop or a paramedic who develops a, a dark humor to cope with the horrors that he's seen. Right. Yeah, he's awesome. He's yeah. so <laughs> epic. Well, listen, congratulations Thank to you, man. You. Thank you. It's an honor to meet you. Well, I've made a lot of mistakes, but Danny's the one good thing I ever did. That being the case, we better make sure he doesn't turn out to be the Antichrist. The rider's going to come out. He'll destroy whoever's got it coming. I'm not afraid of you. I have to ask you, you have the greatest job in the world. You get to play and be other people for a living. It's right. the coolest thing on the planet. I mean, I couldn't even imagine shooting these scenes, you're shooting with the cameras and the rollerblades. Right. If you hypothetically could go back in your career, look at all your characters that you've played, mm -hmm. and be one of those people for a day in real life, who would it be and why? Good question. Um, if I could be any one of my characters, um... <sighs> Good question. <laughs> um, I'm doing a film at the moment with uh, Guillermo del Toro called Pacific Rim. Yeah. And the character I'm playing in that is 
a boss. I mean, he yeah. is a boss. I mean, he I mean makes decisions that affect the world, and um, I would be him. The whole idea of them shooting this uh, the way they did with the with the cameras and the rollerblades, and you're on the motorcycle doing your own stunts. Is it freeing as an actor, like seeing these directors almost like having the time of their lives? Like, you generally don't think about directors having that much fun. It's inspiring when the directors are not just sitting behind the monitors watching, right. but they actually get involved like that. Yeah. You know, like they operate themselves. So that's definitely inspiring. And like when you've got the director right there and you're doing a stunt together, it's a team effort. Yeah. Um, you know, he's in. Go for it, you know, with your performance and all that stuff, and that, that really makes a big difference. If I walk away now, I'm just turning one demon for another. Plus, I have some personal issues I kind of like to get fixed. I love the decision you made with the eyes in the movie. That was your, your idea to make yeah. your eyes that color. Mm -hmm. I want to ask you, as an actor, um, do you ever actually fill in elements of your characters that aren't necessarily in the script? Do you ever make up like background stories? Um, you know, when I approach a character, you know, you certainly read the script and that's your spine. That's where you learn who he is. And then you fill in the blanks, you know, and you, the directors and the other actors, the writer perhaps, you know, you sit down and you kind of connect the world. You know, and you can tell some films that they haven't done the homework a little bit because it won't make sense. Right. But with this character, you know, um, I definitely wanted, to, you had to figure out who he was, you know. So it says, a drunk monk, uh, monk warrior. It was a drunken monk warrior, whatever it was. Greatest description of all time. Yeah, yeah a warrior monk, that's <laughs> yeah. what it was. And I was like, okay, what does that mean? And he likes his wine. Well, you know, so we, you know, Brian and Mark and I, we sort of worked that out, talked about that, who he was. We kind of figured out, how does he speak? How does he sound? You know, we didn't want him to make him American because it wouldn't quite ring true to his character. We wanted to make him, or English, we just wanted to make him some sort of European sound in person. The eyes were definitely a choice uh, for two reasons. One, because the character was described as having eyes that looked like they could see you through the soul. And two, because, you know, I'm in the Marvel family with this other character, Thor, who yeah. also has weird eyes. So I'm in my head saying Thor and, I mean, Heimdall and Moro are related in some way. You know, so... Is that strange being in two Mar two different Marvel films? Is that like it's it's almost like you're crossing streams, like, like in Ghostbusters? You know little what I mean? bit, little <laughs> bit. But you know, one's Marvel Kings or whatever it's called in Marvel, and so there's a slight, you know, different. But um, but it, you know, the t I feel like the two characters can sort of live in sync because they're very different yep. and of different worlds, but maybe come from one source. The writers coming. Hell yes. Yeah.